Hello, I'm Jim Sahoviak, and welcome to our second of the longer versions of these webinars in the AT uh, Professional Development Series for the state of Iowa. Today we're going to talk about uh, something that confuses a lot of folks and try and hopefully clear up some of that confusion when we talk about accessible instructional materials. And a few of the topics we're going to look at is understanding what NIMIS, what NIMAC, and what Bookshare mean. What I've got coming here is a um, this is adapted from a, a 2008 uh, presentation from the Iowa Department of Education that tried to uh, that tried to um, educate people on on the differences between these three things because there are there is a lot of confusion that floats around when we start talking about yeah NIMIS, NIMAC, Bookshare, accessible instructional materials. So hopefully we can clear that up today. Feel free to shoot questions at me uh, whenever you've got them here. Um, so this is kind of why we decided to do this. On the IEP, I think it's on page B, this box exists. It says, this student's NIMIS eligible. Check yes or no. And, and a lot of teachers, a lot of individuals that we've talked to basically say, what's NIMIS? Or we don't know when we're supposed to check that box. And there's no real guidance as to when you're supposed to check that box on here. Um, I know we're working with the state right now to try and get that changed so that that box or that that reads the students access, is um, eligible for accessible instructional materials, but we haven't quite gotten that taken care of yet. So we'll see if that changes, but in the meantime, we're looking at is this student NIMIS eligible, yes or no? What does that mean? And to get to that point, to find out what that means, we're going to have to take a look at a few things. We're going to look at some definitions today. We're going to look at AIM uh, and definitions. We'll look at the Chafee Amendment. We'll talk about eligibility. We'll talk about NIMIS, NIMAC. We'll talk about Bookshare. We'll talk about the IEP team responsibilities as well. So first, let's go back to where this all starts. If we look at IDEA 2004, there's a piece that talks about accessible instructional materials. And what it says in there is that um, provisions with er, the, it, that textbooks and any core related material uh, provided to students with need to be provided to students with print disabilities in specialized formats in a timely manner. We'll break down what that means throughout the rest of this webinar, but that's that's the law. You have to have format text formatted for the student in the way that they can use it in a timely manner. That's idea. That's special ed law. Why are special form specialized formats needed? Well, um, there are a lot of students that cannot access printed material from a textbook for whatever reason. And those students, if they can't access printed material from a textbook, they can't um, they, they, they can't have their needs met in the classroom setting. They're not able to complete tasks, not able to meet IEP goals, not able to access the general education curriculum. Any of those things could happen to a student that might struggle with um, accessing uh, accessing a standard print textbook. So because of that, the technology exists to be able to provide text in an alternative format to students with print disabilities. And we're going to look at what some of that means here today. So some of the important definitions we're going to talk about. We'll talk about what textbooks and core instructional materials mean. We'll talk about what specialized formats mean. We'll talk about timely manner. And we'll talk about the Chafee Amendment to the Copyright Act. First off, textbooks and core instructional materials. When we talk about textbooks, what we're talking about are printed books uh, and related printed core materials, so material that are uh, required for learning in the classroom. These texts, as it says on the slide, are generally written and published primarily for use in elementary and secondary institutions. They do not include other types of books or trade publications. So when we're talking about textbooks and core instructional materials, generally, when you hear core instructional materials, you can think of things along the lines of workbooks. That's kind of what that go along with textbooks. That kind of is where they tend to go with core instructional materials. And as it says there, it does not include trade books or trade publications. Uh, and also, it typically doesn't include literature books either. Although there are ways to get literature works of literature in um, uh, in specialized formats for folks. Uh, the other way to look at it is materials required by students for use in the classroom. That can be where it gets a little bit confusing because in a literature class or an English class, you're often required to read literature books. But when we're talking about textbooks and core instructional materials, we're talking about those books primarily printed for learning in a sec 
uh, in a elementary, secondary, or post-secondary setting. And it doesn't include trade books. It doesn't include trade publications. We talk about specialized formats. What we're talking about there are four things. And you can see the logo for Iowa's True Aim. This is an initiative that the state um, put out through the State Department of Ed a couple years ago, where we're trying to uh, help people understand accessible instructional materials and the specialized formats they might exist in. And these are the four formats that we're really looking at. Braille. So for somebody with a visual impairment or who's blind, they would need text in a Braille in a Braille setting. Large print. Just what it says it is, larger versions of the text for somebody that might have a visual impairment that's not blind but can still see, but might need might not be able to see a typical printed textbook. Audio. Audio would be an MP3 of text being read out loud without visual of that text. So it might be you know somebody reading the text to the student. It might be a, a digital conversion where it's a computer synthesized voice reading that. But audio is an MP3 without the text. Digital text. Is is uh, is something that can be run on the computer that can be read by text readers that can be highlighted as it's read that can that color can be changed that can be the size can be changed background can be changed that's probably one of the more more popular ways to provide accessible instructional materials especially to students with learning disabilities is through digital text because that digital text can be manipulated in so many different ways and actually once you have something as digital text you could take and create any of those other three out of that and that's kind of where NIMUS starts getting to is NIMUS is a digital format that then we can go and create any of those other kinds of formats that somebody might need to use um, so that's the the definition of, of the specialized formats now where we get into um, what we get into next is the definition of timely manner. And really, it's a pretty simple definition. Um, based on the Iowa rules of special ed, you have to deliver accessible instructional material to the student with a disability at the same time that every other student receives their instructional materials. So basically, that means on the first day of class, you better have that accessible instructional material in the format the student needs to the student with a disability while you're handing out textbooks to every other student. We can't be trying to make up for that throughout the year. We can't be doing it chapter at a time. When you give a student a textbook, you have to give the students with disabilities their alternative formats of these texts as well. Um, this is an issue, uh, and we actually recently saw a complaint about this to the Department of Ed in Iowa. There was a student who was on an IEP and was checked as NIMUS eligible. So he was supposed to be getting text in a digital format, I believe. And it was supposed to happen at the same time everybody else gets it, because it's the timely manner issue there. Well, this kid was not getting his text at the same time as everyone else. He was getting them, and they were trying to catch up chapter by chapter in an MP3 format. So it violated some of the things that were written into his IEP. So because it violated this, the district had to go back and provide corrective action over the summer. They had to, at no charge to the family, make up for the, uh, the time that he had missed the education that he had missed when he didn't have the the material in the format that he needed. So I mean these are this is something that just happened uh, this past school year. So this is something that that happens and that uh, we need to be aware of. So we need to make sure that when we are providing digital text to students that it does happen at the same time that everybody else is getting their uh, their textbooks and their materials. So this kind of brings us to okay. We're getting closer to NIMUS. It brings us to you know how do we get these formats for students? How do we get this material for students? And, and, and one of the key components is a piece of uh, legislation in the Copyright Amend and the Copyright Act, and it's the the Chafee Amendment to the Copyright Act. This Chafee Amendment basically says. Authorized entities are able to reproduce and distribute specialized formats of text for students with qualifying disabilities without requiring permission from publishers. So if we break that down and, and take a look at it, what it's telling us 
is that if the government authorizes an entity to do this, they don't have to go to the publisher every time they have a student that maybe needs digital text or needs Braille and ask if they can do that. They can take a copy of that textbook and they can convert it into the format that that student needs. But only authorized entities are, are allowed to do that. So um, we'll get to who's an authorized entity in just a minute. But what this means, again, is students free of charge to the student, they can, uh, authorized entities can take and convert that text into a format that's going to benefit that student without having to go through and ask the publisher permission to do so. Um, so there's a series of students that are eligible under this Copyright Act as amended. And, and, and there's, there's really three groups. There's students, or there's, I'm sorry, yeah, there's four groups. There's students who are blind. They would be eligible for uh, uh, obtaining um, text in a format that's uh, accessible to them. Students with visual impairments, they would be uh, eligible to receive that. Students with physical limitations that affect the, the way that they access a textbook. So if you had a disability with your hands or arms, you couldn't turn pages, you would be qualified under the Chafee Amendment to receive accessible instructional materials in a specialized format. Um, if you had a physical disability that didn't affect your hands or arms, you would not be uh, eligible to receive those, uh, those uh, digital or the text in a, in a specialized format. And then the last one is kind of where it gets a little bit hairy. And we start talking about students with reading disabilities that result from an organic dysfunction, such that the severity to prevent their reading printed material in a normal manner. Now, this is where we get confused. People say, well, what does this mean? What does organic or non-organic mean? And what organic means, we take a look at this, organic means that an organic cause of a reading problem includes those related to a dysfunction of the neural pathways required for fluent reading. So oftentimes something like dyslexia would fall under that because it's, uh, it's, it's of a physical nature to the individual. A non-organic issue would be a reading problem caused by something that's unrelated to neural pathway problems that might include something like not being proficient in English, a lack of instruction, or a behavior disorder. I want to take a look at, I want to show you something here that the Iowa Department of Ed puts out. Um, and I'm going to just share my desktop quick to show you this. Um, there is, so the other kicker with um, the, uh, the issue with uh, organic disability is the student, if you have an organic disability, to be eligible, you have to have a physician sign off that the student has a disability of an organic nature, a learning disability of organic nature. So the IO Department of Ed has on their website a, uh, a sheet of paper that parents can download take to the physician that shows the physician's role in obtaining instructional materials for these students. And it kind of talks about what specialized formats are, um, how a student can benefit from these. But the key down here is it explains, um, if you look here, it explains what organic and non-organic mean. So you can see you know, an example of organic cause might be dyslexia. Non-organic would be you know, limited prof English proficiency, lack of instruction, poor attendance, oppositional defiant disorder, behavioral disorders. Any of those uh, would be not necessarily be organic. And then what has to happen, if we scroll down even further, the, uh, you have to write out the information about the student. And then the doctor has to sign and certify that the student has a reading disability of an organic nature if they're going to receive these materials with that learning disability. If you don't have to be a doctor to sign off on it. Or you could get other folks to sign off on it if you are uh, blind, visually impaired, or have a physical disability. But for the learning disability, for access to NIMAS files, which we'll get into in a minute, you have to have a doctor sign off on that. Um, so hopefully that doesn't, is there any questions on that while we're uh, hopefully not confusing people too much with that? You know, if I see a question pop up, I, I will come back and address that. So 
again, so now what has to happen if for all of these folks that are eligible for accessible instructional materials through the Copyright Act, there has to be a competent authority that signs off on it. We've kind of already talked about a competent authority for somebody with a learning disability, but now we'll talk about competent authorities for um, students who are Chafee eligible, NIMAS eligible, and Bookshare eligible as well. So a competent authority would be considered, in the case of blindness or physical disabilities, there's a whole list of people that could sign off on that individual, that student having blindness or physical disability. In the case of, uh, so in the case of those, we could have a doctor of medicine, doctor of osteopathy, ophthalmologist, optometrist, registered nurse, therapist, or even professional staff, which includes everything from social worker, caseworker, counselor, teacher, superintendent. Any of those folks could sign off and say, this person's blind, this person has a physical disability affecting reading, this person is visually impaired, we're going to get accessible instructional materials for them uh, through the Chafee Amendment. Now again, we just covered this. In the case of a reading disability caused by an organic dysfunction, it absolutely has to be a doctor or an MD or a DO that's going to sign off and say this kid's NIMAS eligible. If it's not a doctor or a DO and they sign off and say the kid's NIMAS eligible, it, it's not going to work. It has to be one of those two for NIMAS eligibility. Um, I guess the question comes up, you know, do all students who have reading difficulties have a print disability? And, and, and as we kind of saw through um, the organic, non-organic thing, not every student that struggles with reading print has um, a, an organic disability, or has a disability, a print disability. Um, they, as it says, your students with print disabilities under the Copyright Act are those that have been certified by a competent authority and are unable to read printed materials because of visual impairment, blindness, or physical limitations, or an organic dysfunction. And so again, we saw that those, it's a broader group that can certify somebody as blind or physically disabled, a very narrow group that can certify somebody under Chafee for NIMAS materials as, a, um, as having an organic learning disability. Let's take a look here, at the, again, with the Chafee Amendment. So before, if you remember, we looked at this, we talked about authorized entities are able to go ahead and create these alternative materials for folks without having to talk to the, um, the publishers. Well, let's take a look at what authorized entities might be here. An authorized entity uh, listed under Chafee is, is an authorized entity are nonprofit organizations or government agencies that have the primary mission to provide specialized services relating to training, education, or adaptive reading or information access needs of blind or other persons with disabilities. So uh, nonprofit or government agencies, they have to be approved. In the state of Iowa, I believe there's one authorized entity when it comes to accessing NIMAS files. And then authorized entity within the state is the Department for the Blind. That fits as a governmental agency that is the primary mission to provide specialized services, in this case, to the blind. But for a, the instructional materials, they would cover everybody in the state. So that's your authorized entity. So now let's get to that term NIMAS that we've heard. Really, when, when NIMAS sits in that IEP, check or that, that box in the checklist says is, is the student NIMAS eligible or not, it probably really should say is the student Chafee eligible or not or copy, uh, are they, are they uh, eligible for uh, accessible instructional materials. But it does say NIMAS eligible. So let's just kind of look at what, how these two are related. What NIMAS is, is it's intended to help expedite the process for providing print instructional materials in the classroom to students uh, in specialized formats. So NIMAS is actually a standard. NIMAS is a standard set by the, the federal government that said, this is the standard we're going to follow. Every textbook that gets turned into a, a digital format should be done in this, in this NIMAS format, so then we can take that and easily convert it into Braille, convert it into large print, convert it to audio, convert it to digital text. A NIMAS file is not something that's really readable. It's, got, it's, it's tagged so that people can navigate it uh, in an auditory manner, so there's easy navigation within it. You can't really read a NIMAS file. It has to be converted to something else to be able to access it. 
but this is kind of the term that's caught on when we talk about accessible instructional materials. And in fact, as you saw, it's made it into the IEP. We say it's a student eligible for NIMIS related for NIMIS materials. Basically, what that means when you see that now, now knowing what NIMIS is, is the student eligible to request accessible instructional material? Can they then have access to these federal NIMIS files that can be turned into uh, a digital format of their or a, a Braille or audio, uh, whatever they need to be able to access text in the classroom. So with that in mind, basically what NIMIS is, is it, it is a standard and, and only certain groups of students can access those files that are created in that standard without having to purchase a textbook on their own. So there's, when we talk about NIMIS, there's two other terms in here. So there's NIMIS. NIMIS stands for the National Instructional Material Accessibility Standard. Again, basically it's an XML file that we can take and turn into different formats, different specialized formats pretty easily. But it's one standard file that uh, everybody knows what they're going to get when they get this standard file and it's easy to convert. The NIMAC is the National Instructional Materials Accessibility Center. This is an area that maintains these NIMIS files that they get from publishers. And then uh, that is where your authorized entities would go to get those NIMIS files to convert them for students. Bookshare is another thing that's out there. It's a little bit different than these other two. It's an online library of digital books for people with print disabilities. So they can take, uh, they're, they're a little bit easier to access. And we'll talk about Bookshare in a couple minutes here. But NIMIS and the NIMAC, those are the key things right now. NIMIS is the standard, NIMAC is the center. Now the way that center, the way things are supposed to go down is that when a, uh, a school district orders textbooks. There's language they're supposed to put in the contract that says, please, basically, please send a NIMIS copy of this textbook to the NIMAC for students with disabilities to access. And so the company will then either say they've already done that or they'll agree to do that. They'll mark up their file, the, the digital file of the book that the school's purchased. Uh, with the, the tags to be able to navigate, they'll get it in that XML format, they'll send it to the NIMAC Center. Then when somebody needs NIMAC files, their IEP has checked yes, that they're NIMAC eligible, the school would call up the Department for the Blind to say, hey, next year we're doing this textbook, this student needs it in this format. The Department for the Blind would go to the NIMAC, they'd pull it out of there if they had it, they would convert it and they'd get it back to the student in a timely manner when everybody else is getting their text. That's kind of the process for NIMIS and how that works. Again, is there any questions on that? OK, if not, we'll kind of keep moving on this. I'm trying not to create confusion. I know there's a lot of confusion out there with this right now. So here's the NIMIS again, or the NIMAC Center again. It's that National Repository of NIMIS Files. It receives and catalogs them. It provides access to them um, free of charge. Again, that's another key to this. It's free of charge for the school and for the student to get these format, these te this text converted into a format that they that they need for the student. Um, and again, it uh, it, it maintains the pre procedures to protect against copyright infringement. And the the one authorized entity within Iowa is the Iowa Department for the Blind. There is a second authorized entity, but it's more on a national level. And that's Bookshare, which we'll talk about in just a second here. But for the, I for the state of Iowa, the Department for the Blind is the group that's going to be able to go and access NIMAC. So what they actually ask is that if you have a student that's NIMAC eligible, that can get these NIMAC files, and they need them converted and, and, and ready to go for the school year, they ask that you get them your request six months in advance to be able to to grab those books and convert them. And that can be a long time out, but you have to plan for that with students that have these accessible instructional material requirements. I mean, that's probably, they probably don't need as much time to convert something to digital text or to MP3, but Braille conversion can be a long process. It can result in lots of, uh, lots of pages of Braille. It needs to, they need to have the time to be able to do that. So the Iowa Department for the Blind right now is probably it's, it's definitely the best place to go if you need these Braille related texts. But you have to make sure you get things to them six months in advance of when you need them. So that kind of brings us to Bookshare. Now Bookshare is a little bit different. It's, it's the same concept as the NIMAC, but it's a little bit different because it's a little bit more open to be able to access this. 
Bookshare is an online library of digital books. Basically, it's available to any of those same qualified students um, who were able to access or who qualified under the copyright amendment. But it's funded through OSEP, so it doesn't cost students, doesn't cost schools anything to access Bookshare. There are in this book, in this uh, in this online library, there's over 171,000 titles. In fact, it went up over 172,000 a day. They're constantly adding new titles, and in there they have digital books. That's more your kind of works of literature. They have textbooks, they have teacher recommended reading, and they have periodicals in there that can be accessed. Also, with Bookshare, if they if you ask them for something and they don't have it, they'll go out and get it and create it in a digital format for you. This is a very underutilized resource. It's an excellent resource. It's easy for going and downloading books, accessing them almost immediately without going through the middleman of having to go through the Department for the Blind and having it converted. It gets the book in a format that that student can access in a digital format on the computer and have read back out loud to them or turn into an MP3. Or if we need to convert to Braille, we can have it done that way as well. Now, what I mean by underutilized, we talked to Bookshare about a year ago, asked them about the state of Iowa and how well we were doing. They told us the state of Iowa is one of the best users of Bookshare in the country. On the flip side of that, only 17% of Iowa schools are actually accessing Bookshare. Now, that's probably gone up a little bit since we last talked to them about this, but not, a, not enough schools are utilizing this free service to be able to download and get books uh, quickly in a format that's going to be accessible to students. So more on Bookshare. Really, this is the easiest way for schools to access uh, accessible text directly. I'll show you how it works in just a minute. It's, it's a website, Bookshare.org. You sign up. You go in. The school and the district can sign up for an organizational membership. Once you do that, you, you set up one person as your primary account manager. So that person is going to be the one that kind of keeps track of everything. From there, we can designate just about anybody as a, uh, as a sponsor. When you have a sponsor, they can download unlimited books for students. So a spot, the student doesn't go in necessarily and download those books themselves at school. The teacher would download those books and plug them in and, and, and dish them off to a student to be able to access those. Um, and, and you would have it pretty quickly and pretty easily in that digital format. Now, who qualifies for this? You have to enroll the qualified students. Anybody that's Chafee eligible does uh, does qualify. Now, one of the kickers to Chafee that we'll look at in a few minutes too is you have to be on an IEP. It looks like for Bookshare you don't have to do that. In fact, I believe that's what the state of Iowa is saying. You don't have to be on an IEP to access some of these Bookshare tools. So this is kind of how it breaks down for Bookshare and who's eligible now. Students with visual impairments or students who are blind, and this comes straight from the Bookshare website. Students with visual impairments or students who are blind or low vision are qualified. Again, it gives a big list of folks that can certify them as qualified. A family doctor, ophthalmologist, optometrist, teacher of the visually impaired, special ed teacher, uh, National Library Service for the Blind, any of those folks can certify that student as blind. A student with a physical disability that affects the ability to read print, like the ability to turn pages. Again, large group, family doctor, medical professional, physical therapist, resource specialist, or special ed teacher. Now, this is where it gets different. Remember, for NIMAS eligibility, you had to have a doctor sign off on somebody having an organic dysfunction to be able to access those NIMAS files if you had a learning disability. If we look here for students with learning disabilities in Bookshare, it has to be a student with a severe enough disability and a professional certifying the disability as a physical basis. So there's your organic part. But what they require is they don't require just a doctor. You can have a neurologist, a psychiatrist, a learning disability specialist, a special ed teacher, a school psych, uh, or a clinical psychologist with background in learning disabilities. That's a much wider door to get into Bookshare than what we saw with, um, with NIMAS files, where you just have to have a doctor. In this case, if a special ed teacher says this student has a learning disability, it's of an organic nature, they absolutely cannot read text, we're going to get them access to, to Bookshare. Now, what this isn't supposed to be used as, it's not just supposed to be sign everybody in your school up for Bookshare and get these free texts. It is meant to be used by those that have 
pretty severe reading disabilities and cannot are beyond the point of being able to learn to read effectively uh, or manage behavior and help them be able to read effectively. It has to be somebody that really does have a learning disability that cannot access printed text and may need something read back out loud to them. That's how you're going to get somebody with a learning disability uh, attached to Bookshare and uh, be able to access some of these texts. Now, if you look down here, uh, these groups do not qualify. Students with autism, students with emotional disabilities, students with ADHD, English language learners, or English as a second language learners. They don't qualify if that's the only issue. If that's an issue that is uh, secondary to one of these other issues, they can qualify through one of these three areas to access Bookshare. So that's kind of how Bookshare works. So again, if we kind of circle back, well, I guess we'll talk about Bookshare usage for a second. Um, well, no, while we're talking about the qualified stuff, we'll circle back and talk about this again. So if you have it, if you have a student that's on an IEP, has a physical disability, a visual impairment, or a organic learning disability that's signed up by a doctor, they can access NIMIS files. If you have if you have a student that is, they can also access Bookshare files. If you have a student that's not on an IEP or that has a learning disability that's signed off on by a special ed teacher, they, so for the learning disability part, you do have to be on an IEP. For the other two, you don't. They can access Bookshare files. Bookshare is actually basically a, a three different libraries, because Bookshare is also an entity that can access NIMIS files. Bookshare has the Bookshare files, NIMIS files, and public domain files. Public domain files are, are files that are out of copyright because it's been 75 years since they were copywritten, and, and, and anybody can access them for free at that point. So a lot of your classics kind of fall under that. But so again, with that, with that Bookshare file, then uh, you have an IEP. Uh, you have one of those three areas you can access NIMIS, Bookshare, and Bookshare. Bookshare can access NIMIS for you that way. If you don't fall under one of those criteria, but you fall under Bookshare eligibility, you can access anything in the Bookshare or public domain library. So you still have a lot of access to lots of different things in there. Bookshare, again, uh, the way it works, you just search for downloaded books for qualified students. You do have, if you have two students that need the same book, you do have to download it twice. It can't just be a one time and share it. It has to be downloaded so they can track that it's going to each individual student. They also do offer free software for access to some of their stuff. They offer a Victor Reader. They also offer Read Out Loud, which is probably their more popular thing for students with learning disabilities. They can download this Read Out Loud software. They can then download books and have it read back out loud to them pretty quickly and pretty easily. Students can also, by the way, get individual memberships that they can sign up for uh, once the school is already providing them a uh, membership. And then they can access these things at home on their home computer as well. There is a mobile app that's called Read to Go. Although Bookshare itself is free, the app is $20. But I'll tell you what, if you have students that use iPads and want to be able to have text read back out loud to them on the iPad, it's the best thing going for reading text. You download the book directly to your iPad, you hit play, it reads and it highlights as it's going through and reading. So the Bookshare app is fantastic. It's, it's definitely worth the $20. Let me take a look here at Bookshare, kind of show you what this looks like and how it works. Let me go back and share my desktop with you briefly. Um, and we'll take a look at, at Bookshare. So Bookshare is uh, a website. If we pull up, pull up the website here, www.bookshare.org. Here's where we, this is kind of the, the, open, the opening screen to Bookshare. You can see here, here's the titles that they have, 172,000, over 172,000. If you needed information on membership, this is where you can find it under the Membership tab. If you go to Membership Overview or Membership Options or Qualifications, if you go to Qualifications, there's that list I showed you of who qualifies. And here's some frequently asked questions down here. You know, how do you qualify if you have a visual disability if you have a learning disability? And here, right in the learning disability piece, it says you know, if you're a student in K-12 that has an IEP and a specific learning disability that need text accommodations, um, you should be able to access Bookshare. I will show you in the membership, if we go up here to membership and we look at membership options, there is also a um, a purchase option. So if you don't qualify for the 
options funded by OSEP, like we talked about, if you're not in K-12 or post-secondary, there is a $75 a year membership or $75, $25 one-time setup fee and 50 annual fee to be able to access Bookshare and all the books within it. So basically, this is how Bookshare works. Oh, I'll also show you here under Getting Started. If you go to the Reading Tools tab, that is where you will find um, your free assistive technology devices. If you click on that, you can see there's, um, oh, we want the free readers. I'm sorry, free readers for Bookshare members. If we go to free readers for Bookshare members, that'll show us there's our Victor Reader stream. There's Read Out Loud. If you go to download this, please make sure to download the acapella voices as well, or else your Bookshare is not going to read, and it's going to be frustrating because it's hard to figure out that that's why it's not reading. So you do have to make sure to download the voices as well. Um, so when we download Read Read Out Loud from Bookshare, this is what we get. This is what Read Out Loud looks like. Uh, it When you open it up, it gives you access directly to uh, Bookshare. So I'm going to go search for a book. I'll type in my email and my password. And it'll log me in. And then it basically asks me what book am I going to look for. So just to show you that um, you know, it's got pretty recent books in here. Let's plug in Hunger Games. A lot of students like to see that one. Hit Hunger Games and hit Search. And it's going to go and it's going to find me the Hunger Games trilogy. See, I have several different options here. There's the Hunger Games. Uh, there's all kinds of different options. I will go and I'm going to open up this Hunger Games. I'll download it. And I have to now select the student that I want to download this to or send this to. And I have to set, so I have to go over here and I have my made up student, Joe Smith. I'll select him. And then actually, I'm going to go to the download format. Daisy with images takes a long time to download. I'm just going to say Daisy text only. That should make it a little bit quicker. Because I don't need the images for this per se. And then we'll hit download books. And we'll download it for Joe Smith. And now it shows us right here that it's available. So if I click on there, it's going to come on and it's going to open up for me. It's loading the book. It'll take a couple seconds here to load the book. And it, it doesn't have, this is, th these question marks are where the images would be had I selected to keep them in there. But now it's in there, and I have access to it. So that's much quicker and much faster than going, you know, giving the Department of the Blind a six-month lead time to go through and put this together. Now, with you see these little links here. That's how a DAISY file is set, where it gives us the ability to click and go, oops, should allow us to go directly to that part of the text. It's taking its time doing it. Let's uh, go back. Oops. So we'll try this one more time. It should have allowed us to jump. Maybe it was still downloading those or opening those pieces for us. Um, but let's see if we can get right back to the Hunger Games. And we'll just scroll down this time once it opens this up for us. And here we go. So we'll scroll it down. We should be able to click on those and jump to that part. But here we go. Here's where our text is. We can go up here and we can click on Read. And I'm not sure. I know you can see that highlighting. I don't know if you can hear that because it's, it's coming through my ear, my headset. But it reads in a pretty decent voice. We have the ability to take and highlight text here.